So I get to moderate a really fun panel, Education and Workforce Trends. And to my left is Dr. Massey from IRSC, glad to have you. 42 years. 42 years. President Parker from Palm Beach State College, how many years? <laughs> and President Kelly from Florida Atlantic University, two and a half years, okay. So we're gonna talk about some fun stuff. First off, education and workforce trends have become very important. The pipeline of talent was talked about with Mark Wilson this morning at length. You folks weren't here. But what type of trends and challenges are you seeing impacting your institution? Go ahead. Yep. It's coming. Okay. Got to warm up. It's been here 42 years also. Yep. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you for letting us host this. And I appreciate Eva and John coming up. It's, it's great to be on a panel with uh, uh, fellow colleagues uh, really interested in dealing and working with education every day of the week. Uh, having been here 42 years, I remember back when uh, we talked and had a committee meeting similar to this many years ago called the Sustainable Treasure Coast. During that study and looking across all of the elements that would help to sustain and build a, a, uh, a sustainable treasure coast, education was a big piece of that. And we looked at a lot of different elements related to education at that time. Of course, the levels of education, the curriculum and the programs that ought to be offered. A lot of the discussion was about uh, what is all of this going to look like in uh, the 21st century and the latter part of the 21st century. Are we doing the right thing for our kids and our students across the secondary level and also the post-secondary level? So I would say one of, the, one of the biggest challenges is that we partner with public schools along with our universities and colleges to be sure that we introduce the 21st century emerging jobs and the elements that are involved in those jobs. And if nothing else, at least introduce the vocabulary of the 21st century. If you go out and talk about nanotechnology, students should be able to relate to what that is, photonics and optics and lasers and robotics and the kinds of things, the key elements in the foundation of driving 21st century jobs in so many different ways. So I think one of the challenges is uh, getting that word out, building the pipeline of students coming through, and, and also then really going through transformational changes at our own institutions. Because when you go from the 1950s, 60s kind of delivery to education to what is needed for the 21st century, it requires a tremendous amount of, of, of thinking into the future buying the right equipment, hiring the right people, and being sure that we have these uh, programs in place. Thank you so much for, um, for pulling us together. Um, it's always wonderful to um, have an opportunity to spend time with Ed and John. I get to see John all the time, since we're both in Palm Beach County, but I don't get to see Ed as much. So, um, so thank you so much. Um, you know, I can think of a couple things that I think are really impacting um, Palm Beach State College and, um, and higher ed in general based upon some of the recent trends. You know what, I answered the wrong question. You asked no, that's, the just, that's the right okay, question. Okay, good. Um, one is that I think that, and um, John and I were recently engaged in a conversation about uh, whether or not, almost as a country, you know, have we, um, have we just kind of systematically and automatically pushed all of our kids into um, a bachelor's program? That is that have we just kind of said at two years old, it's just understood that you are going to go to college and not really college, you almost are saying you're gonna to go to a university and that you're going to um, you know, get a bachelor's degree. And I think that you know, certainly I have young kids and I've started that conversation with them. But there's a question and, and a, a, about whether or not we've gone too far with that and have we pushed students into careers that they're not as interested in or they're not as well suited for if we um, instead also introduce them to the idea that there are careers that they can have that are um, developed from a two-year program or AS program um, or even a, a clock hour program 
um, our, our vocational program that may be just better suited for their talents, better suited for their interests, and also will in many ways possibly make them um, even um, more wealthy <laughs> even over time or even on a short term. You know, I tell folks that it's, it's interesting, and, and so I'm really into this idea that we have to really get students to explore their interests and their sweet spots so that they really are choosing careers that make sense for them and for what they think they will excel in. Because a starting teacher in Palm Beach County, which you know, as a person with young children, I think that education is really important and I want teachers who really want to be there. Um, but the starting salary for a teacher is between 40 and $45,000 in Palm Beach County. And that's after going through a four-year program. You've earned a, a wonderful bachelor's degree from likely Florida Atlantic University. And um, you've passed teacher, your teacher certification exam and you're, and you're hired. Um, whereas a person who's gone through, my, gone through my welding program, and it's a program that took maybe a year and a half to two years, they're graduating making $60,000 a year, and they're sought for throughout the whole country. I mean, folks are recruiting my, our welding graduates from throughout the country. And so I wonder, um, one of the trends that, that is um, it's kind of starting is how is it that we can change the conversation um, with children so that they understand they have options and the options include a technical or a two-year program or some other type program that really may be well suited for their interests um, and also can provide them with economic security that may not be available um, for a bachelor's degree. So, um, so that's one thing. A second thing I tell you is that, um, so um, I am certainly a fan of the idea that we should be measured and that we should do a good job. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. You know, but it has been, it has been very interesting to adjust to the metrics in our business, um, particularly since we're an open access institution and that's a, a state trend. Um, and so that's something that I would say that really has, um, in a lot of positive ways, encouraged us to get students out there and it's encouraged us to ensure that they have employment when they graduate. Um, but then on the on a more difficult side is that so many of our students, they work and they go to school. So it's kind of difficult for that student, because that's about 75% of our population. So it's difficult to try to um, really encourage that student to take, you know, to work less so they can graduate sooner because we're all encouraged to get students out a lot faster. So that's a, a something that has a double-edged sword. You know, on the one hand, I think it's really good because it's made us pay attention to something that maybe we haven't all, always paid attention to, but it's very difficult when students, so many of our students work and go to school at the same time, so. And I would say from a university perspective, um, we, we, we kind of know where the deficits are. So uh, if you listen to our Board of Governors, we're 11 universities, 331,000 students in, in the state of Florida. Um, and in that system, we look constantly at where the uh, jobs are, are predicted for the state. Uh, there is predicted, uh, at least now, to be 50,000 nurses short. Uh, that's, a huge, that's almost an impossible thing to fix unless you're gonna go import nurses from elsewhere. Uh, and very few people want a nurse working on you who uh, learned online. You know, so you, you really want somebody who's had some experiences, and so most of them do some kind of a residency. Uh, we're, we're short on doctors in the state. Uh, we have a growing uh, aging population, a lot of healthcare related issues, uh, not enough physicians. FAU graduates 64 a year, and then they go do a residency. Doctors typically stay fairly close to where they do their residency. So if you had more residency programs in the state of Florida, there'd be more likelihood of doctors wanting to, to stay in Florida after they complete, complete the residency. We have a huge uh, shortage in the state of um, the IT-related industries, uh, workers in that IT industry. In fact, Ava and I have a, a joint project called the Capture Grant, uh, and that was designed specifically to increase the number of students that, <coughs> excuse me, that are in uh, the pipeline for IT-related jobs. I, I do have some statistics. So we've actually, we're the only university in, in uh, state college in the state who beat the, the odds on this. We were projected to have uh, 502 students in the upper division. By now, we have 689. Um, we were projected to have 140 in the lower division. We have 183. Um, that's nowhere near enough, though. It's nowhere near enough. One company 
can grab 143 students magically could easily go take 143 of our students right now. Uh, so we're, there's a big delta there. We just got another uh, very large grant, a uh, uh, $4.6 million grant that will now allow us to try to cultivate more Hispanic students into the IT industry. Just by culture, Asian students typically are migrate toward IT-related uh, type of opportunities. A lot of kids from India like to come here and study IT-related uh, disciplines. But the uh, Hispanic population has not done that as much, so uh, we have a, a $4.6 million grant now to bring more Hispanic students to the universities. Other areas where there are big shortages, um, the engineering professions, still a huge demand uh, for engineers in this area, and, and not enough engineers to provide. Uh, the problem on the other side is there's some disciplines, like my old discipline, where we have a lot of interest and no jobs. So uh, my home department is the biological sciences. It's the most popular major at the university. That and psychology are very popular majors. But uh, what are you going to do, uh, and forgive me any of you that are, I am, I am one so I can talk about them. Uh, but if you're a biological scientist, if you have a 3.5 grade point and above in college, you will likely go to grad school. And you'll likely get a good job after grad school. If you are below 3.5, you're not going to go to grad school and what are you going to do? You, you're going to have to find something that is probably not t totally directly aligned, unless you become a lab technician for life. So we are judged heavily now by metrics. The Board, Board of Governors has set metrics. I insanely think about it day and night. Uh, we did end up finishing first in the state in the metrics this year after being next to last two years ago, middle of the pack five last year, and then number one in the state this year. And we did it because we paid a lot of attention to the things that are measured and tried to make sure we fixed the things that were broken. <clears throat> One of the things that I would say is broken, and Ava uh, touched on it, in, in the university system is the average starting salary, the highest starting salary of any of the universities is 36.5. Now, if you have a lot of debt and you've been going to college for four to six years and you start at 36.5, that is not uh, a great selling story. Uh, it should be, well, and, and as Ava mentioned, it's to go to a teaching profession. There's a huge shortage of teachers, too. If you go to Palm Beach County, Broward County, I don't know about here, but uh, there's probably 400 <coughs> teachers short in each, just being able to have kids have a teacher in your classroom. Uh, but with the starting salaries, 41,500, 41,000, and then in four or five years, you're, you're at 43, 44, 45. Uh, the profession uh, ends up keeping people maybe for a long time who want to stay in teaching, but it's hard to get young people to want to go into a profession. You can't advance very quickly. Uh, and so those are some of the, I think, the challenges we face, and uh, there are opportunities, though, to, to address those. Why could a bio biology student not be turned into a teacher? If you're going to start at 25 as a biology student, you can at least start at 41.5 in Palm Beach County as, as a teacher if you were retooled. You've made a lot of really positive changes at FAU, so I compliment you. You've been here a long time, and I think that's great. And Ava, you've started to make some changes. You shifted the deans and provosts around the college. So we went from not enough jobs to not enough workers. What do we need to turn around a really tight labor market? Palm Beach County unemployment's like 5%. Up here, I think Martin is about 5%. St. Lucie, Indian River's a little over 6%. What do you think we need to do from your perspective to turn around that tight labor market? Well, first of all, on the Treasure Coast, we're working really, really, really hard to bring in a more diversified economy to start with. Um, the other thing, to bring up a point that Ted and I were talking about at the break, and I want to be sure to have a chance to get this one on the table, is what is the issue? Um, do we have students who are graduating that do not have the skills necessary for the jobs, or can we not find people to accept the jobs in the area? Are they just not enough, or are they not qualified? And I think this is a big issue that we have to dig into deeper. And there are a lot of ways to do this to be sure that the curriculum is parallel to what is actually needed in the job market. Uh, during the recession, and all of us know this, there were jobs eliminated, but there were also jobs either downsized or there were jobs that were combined two jobs into one job. So now all of a sudden the job description is different than what it was prior to the uh, recession. 
Changing curriculum at a college and a university takes a while, the steps that we have to go through. I look at the nursing program, John, and, and the nursing program is probably one of the best models of teaching that we have in any of our institutions. So you go to a lecture, you go to a lab, then you go to a hospital while you're actually in training. So you have clinicals during your training sessions before you get your degree. So if we do the same kind of thing or try to develop that same kind of uh, partnership with companies, you can do it through internships, you can do it through shadowing, you can do it through the same kind of arrangement that we have in nursing perhaps, where we actually take the classes of students into the industry and let them participate hands-on as much as possible, just like they do in a hospital, which is a very critical area to work in, but the students are able to do that to a limited amount during their training program. Then they, they, it does a couple of things to them. They understand why what we're teaching them is important to learn, first of all, and they see where it's gonna be used in the workplace, so they're more eager to learn it because they know they're gonna to have to know it. So to parallel the curriculum with what is actually needed by the employers, how do we get there? But I think it's very critical that we do that. Now we three, and John, I'm a biologist also, so maybe biologists can be college presidents. That's, that's another <laughs> job possibility. Um, how, do, how, do we, how do we get at that? How do we have that discussion with businesses and partners, do the surveys to find out where we're in line, <clears throat> do all of the things I mentioned earlier to actually have that stronger partnership and uh, turn out students who really are qualified post-recession to accept the jobs immediately. We run businesses just like you do. About one-third of my cabinet retired this year. We went looking for people, and we had exactly the same problem that you have when you start looking for people. And we have that same problem throughout our entire institution. It's not lack of applicants. We get 40 or 50 applicants, and when we interview them, they don't come close to meeting the requirements of what we're looking for. So that's a problem we've got to dig into deeper and try to resolve that. And some of the techniques I talked about is a way to do that. It's a way for us in education to help do that. Great. You know, I think that um, so often when there's growth in the community, it's not as if it just kind of happens um, organically. I mean, usually there's growth based upon some organization like this or the uh, develop or Economic Development Board or a chamber that is actually making a conscious decision to go after a particular, um, a, a particular market or a particular business. Um, so it's not like we just wake up one day and all of a sudden there's a new company. There have been conversations with someone within, within the business community or within the public sector to make that happen long before it actually started. And so I think one way to address some of the issues with jobs and opportunities is to engage academic ins institutions into the conversations as early as possible. So that is that if you as a development officer with the BDB, if you know that you're about to really focus on recruiting in a particular area, the earlier you have that conversation with John or myself, the more prepared we can be to one, assist you in, in encouraging that company or business to come and two, to ensure that we're prepared for the jobs that are, um, that are on their way. So to me, that's the one thing. It's like if we start our conversations earlier, it's more likely as an, um, an entire community can be prepared. And what I also like about that is that because we have limited resources, we can start investing them in areas where we know that we're trying to create opportunities within our community. Um, the second thing I would suggest is that, you know, clearly the best way for students to get hired once they graduate is if they have an internship while they are in college. So whether it's a short-term or long-term program, the internship, that experience guarantees the opportunity for them. So if there is a way to actually um, work with companies, particularly smaller businesses, and kind of show them how to um, structure programs like that so they make sense for an academic institution, I think that's something that would really help to eliminate some problems pretty quickly. You know, sometimes my folks complain that yes, it's an internship, but you get there and you're making copies and not really engaging in the business at the level that makes a difference. 
that's often a lot of work for a business. That is that you have to really sit down and think about how it is you're gonna engage the student and take the time now that we hope will pay off for you later. So I think if there's any way to, um, to kind of work around or work together with businesses, and most of our communities have smaller businesses, and help them develop meaningful internship programs, I think it's the kind of thing that can help us with job issues right away. Very good. And I would echo, I guess, uh, the comments as well, that uh, the relationship between the universities and the private sector is not always as, as strong as it could be. <laughs> Frequently, I think we use advisory boards as, uh, here, here's how great we are. We're gonna tell you how great we are. We got two hours, we're gonna preach to you. That is not, you're not gonna learn anything as a university by doing that. Maybe you get validated by people who say good things about you in the community. It needs to really be a much deeper engagement. It needs to be more two-way. Um, I think just as important as internships is mentorships, where you have people in the private sector that can kind of take you under the wing and begin to show you things that you can't see by just going to work. Uh, and we started even doing some of that on campus. So we're, uh, as it mentioned, we're, co we're companies. Uh, we're a $767 million a year company called FAU. There are 3,000 people working every day coming to work. All those jobs do not need to be held by people who are full time. So to run a $760 million a year company in the CFO's office instead now of just hiring another technician, another accountant, we hire students into our, so it's an internal internship. So the CFO is now maybe 20 students in her company that are getting real time experience as accountants or finance majors running the company. And when they graduate, uh, they get a job like that because they're not only getting an internal internship, which means they can take classes when they need to, not when Starbucks tells you you don't need to work, uh, but they now have a, a, a reference letter from their mentor, who's the CFO of the university. So far in the university, I think we have um, 50 internal internships. That's not enough, that, but that is 50 internships that are not outside employees, but it could be 100. It could be 200, because there are many things that a very bright student can do uh, that you don't need to go hire a full-time person to do, and it gives them a lot of professional experience as well. That's great. So last week, we did an Academic Leaders Council meeting in Palm Beach County, which these two folks were part of. We assembled all 10 presidents of the universities and colleges of Palm Beach County and had different industry executives talk to them directly about what they needed from them. And that was very beneficial. The first time we ever did that, I think you'll see follow-up meetings to that. The point I'm trying to make was every executive from those companies said we would be happy to sponsor internships or apprenticeships. And I think that's what we're going to focus on as a workforce board. We're seeing a lot of people, older generation people, starting to retire. And we're seeing younger people enter the workforce. Probably one of the biggest complaints I hear when I deal with industry leaders and businesses is that they lack soft skills. They have the hard skills, they're pretty smart at what they do, but those soft skills are really not there. What do you think you could do as a president of an institution to try to help solve that issue? Two, two major things, and, and this is true for all kind of students, whether academic or occupational students. Uh, Every student on our campus has to go through a uh, student uh, success course. It's a required course. Within a, a part of that course, they have to learn how to write a resume. They have to learn about job ready skills in terms of everything from attendance to how to dress properly, how to communicate, how to work in teams, how to be a part of a of a work environment where you would be a productive uh, contributor to that work environment. The other thing we've done is uh, we have about 72, uh, Donna, you can correct me here, but about 72 different uh, AS degree programs, which are job preparatory kind of programs within the college. Now we've taken in every one of those job prep programs, we have put in an employability skills module. So a portion, whether you're gonna be a welder, or whether you're gonna be an auto technician, or whether you're gonna hold some other kind of job, 
as you go through that training program, you will have a module that involves employability skills. And I think we're gonna be turning out students that uh, are more adjusted and understand the work environment better from the employability skills module, as well as those specific skills they have to learn, whether it's in auto tech or welding or one of the other areas, even, even nursing. You know, I, um, you're, you're right. I mean, most of the employers we talked to last week, they talked about not, um, students not having soft skills. Yeah, I'm thinking that, you know, as long as kind of, as, I used to also say, man, I can't believe that, you know, you're getting these tattoos, but now everybody has a tattoo, so I figure eventually, <laughs> I guess that's going to be okay. Um, and and uh, I'm not sure when, but I'm, I'm sure at some point it's going to happen, so I, I wonder about this question. But the, the one thing I think that, um, that I think we can do and that we're looking at doing, and, and we also have this mandatory course um, that Ed just talked about, but also is that if we have more collaborative learning, I think it does, it goes a long way to kind of get students um, more accustomed to talking to each other more and working together more. Because it seems that employers are looking more for people who, um, who can work in teams within their, within their businesses these days. Mm -hmm. So I think the more that I develop learning spaces that suggest more collaborative um, um, processes and also encourage students to work more with each other, I think that may go a long way with the soft skills. But there's a part of me that also thinks that um, because I think technology is here to stay, I almost feel like that is also going to have a change in the business um, and I guess in industry altogether. I think that because there are so many millennials and because there's so much use of technology, there's a part of me that really believes that that is going to start to be the trend and that this idea of soft skills is going to have a different meaning based upon how technology is used in business. So. Yeah, and uh, we had uh, some consultants come in to talk to us about <coughs> this kind of next generation coming. So the millennials are kind of moving on out now and the Generation Z is on the way. So they said uh, the uh, millennials have a 12 second attention span. Generation Z, eight seconds. <laughs> And you know, when you got someone with an eight second, by the time I finish this sentence, you're not listening, right? <laughs> with an eight second attention span. So um, how do you hold a t the attention of a person who is so glued into their technology that it's very difficult to, to keep their attention? Uh, and that may not work well in a classroom for you, but it certainly doesn't work well in a work setting either when a person can't really hold their attention for a long period of time. What we've started doing, a couple things that I think, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll find out if it works, uh, but I, I think they're at least good ideas to, to move forward on. One is a flipped classroom. So instead of sitting in a classroom and being lectured to, what if you had to do all that and then you come to the classroom for discussion instead of being lectured to? So flipping the classroom where the classroom experience is really an engagement experience with the faculty member instead of you know writing on the board or showing slides or doing the traditional lecture. The other is, um, Historically, you didn't really do research in a university until you were at the master's level. And what we have done is somewhat decided to start moving all those, I, those engagement things where you're really close to a faculty member, you're working on a complex problem, you're trying to get to places where you can write about it, answer it, give oral presentations on it. So we now, this year, two years ago, we had about 300 students in undergraduate research. Uh, last year, 2,000, this year, 4,000. That's a lot of, I mean, we have a total undergraduate population of 25,000. So basically one out of every five of our students is now engaged in research as undergraduates. And those are typically teams. So you would, let's say I'm an engineer, I would have on my team perhaps uh, someone from English and someone from the College of Business. And maybe I'm gonna make a prosthetic device that goes on my knee and it bends my knee for physical therapy while I watch TV. And you can take your Apple, uh, uh, your, your handheld uh, phone and you twist your phone and it moves this way, this way. And actually one of our students did that. But she was not very gifted at writing. So the English major wrote a beautiful proposal to get her funding <laughs> for this idea. The business student put a business plan around it. The three of them together are thinking of starting a company. Hmm. And, and so that's where you, know, you start to see these, they're, they're now learning things that there is no book to teach you but you're learning the soft skills of how to work in a, in a team setting. So those are just a couple of examples I think are, are gonna be interesting to follow. That's a good story. So you guys have been here in South Florida for a while. Where do you see the economy growing? What sectors 
do you see? A lot of entrepreneurship is starting in Palm Beach County. I don't know about the Treasure Coast as much. What do you see the economy is growing? Where do you see it going? And I think, uh, I think Mark uh, pointed it out this morning in his presentation. Uh, I, uh, some, of the, some of the things he said about the Treasure Coast were a little troubling to me about uh, losing 59-year-old to 80-year-old people, 35,000 people uh, losing them. But uh, small businesses in a, in a district of the state of Florida like the Treasure Coast is just uh, paramount to uh, the economy as a whole. Uh, it's important that these small businesses stay abreast of what's going on so that they remain relevant in the business world. So what we have put in place across our college, and there's one right across the uh, hall here from this uh, auditorium, is an entrepreneurship area. It is a staging area to bring existing companies in through Small Business Development Center that is also located there to help small businesses. We have free uh, uh, individuals that will go out, consultants that will go out, look at your company, and then make the necessary suggestions to changing your company, whether it's in technology or other things, to stay relevant. Then we will take a class with a capstone project, and we will assign that specific uh, class to solving this problem for a small business located in the community. So if you think about it, or if you have a small business and you need help, let us know about it. You have that problem, you don't have the resources, you can't quite solve it, we'll give you free consultants to look at it, outline the solution to the problem, then invite in a class of students to actually resolve that problem for you. Now that's a win-win-win all the way across. The students get to build a portfolio. They get to tell their potential employer when they do get out of, uh, when they earn their credential, that they have had real life experience and they can show them in a portfolio that real life experience. Entrepreneurship uh, major. We have uh, incubators located on this campus, on the Fort Pierce campus, and also we have a virtual incubator. We have about uh, 32 clients and some of these are students, and some of them are community people who have ideas that they want to try and, and to turn it into a business. So again, we engage students in the development of the business plan. We engage students. We have marketing students that we will engage in developing the marketing plan for the business. We have technology students that will engage in the technology of putting the business together and help you in the incubators to make that happen. So I think, uh, I think we have to put an awful lot of effort on small business, keep them current, the creation of new small businesses on the Treasure Coast. And also, let me get one other plug in. I, I give a lot of talks like we all do across our area, and I can talk about the things I mentioned in the beginning, from robotics to laser tech and so forth. But many times, somebody raises their hands and says, hey, that's all well and good, but I need my air conditioner fixed. Okay, we got planning money last year from the legislature following up this year to actually build a new industrial skills building that will have uh, auto tech, have welding, have air conditioning, heating repair, have smart manufacturing, 3D uh, printers, the whole bit in this, in this new building. So I would like to hear from you. If you have needs in a company that would be accommodated through this training facility when the planning stages of this, so please talk to us and let's see if we can incorporate your ideas into the building. I think that um, you know, it kind of depends upon the November elections in some ways. Um, you know that um, there is the, the penny sales tax initiative that is on the ballot in Palm Beach County. And I think that if that, um, if that initiative passes, I think that there's going to be um, a boom in the construction area um, just based upon the plans for the infrastructure and all the buildings that the school district would like to add and the renovations that they're looking to provide. And so that means not just, um, not just a carpenter, but that means a welder, um, a heavy, heavy machinist, it means like a electrical HVAC. So I think that there will be a, a big push in the trades, particularly in the county, based upon this, I mean, this one cent sales tax should it pass. 
But I think also there is an, um, a push in that area generally because it's an aging population and there's an anticipation that there's going to be um, quite a bit of retirement in that area. So I think that you know, with the sales tax, I think that if that should pass, it kind of doubles. Without that, I do think so, I do think there's growth in that area. Um, I find it interesting, but that that, that um, it seems to be a, um, a certainly a growth in healthcare um, to me. And I think that this idea of certainly nurses, and you know, we all seem to try to do our part to meet the demand for nurses. But I think health sciences is an area, and all those other types of jobs that support medical offices and hospitals. Um, that seems to be something that is um, growing rapidly within the region. And then I'll you know, piggyback on that as something that I'm sure, John, I'm sure John will talk about, but the biosciences and support of uh, Max Planck and the work that John is doing up in the North County, I think will also be a part of, of our growth um, within the county. Yeah, I think uh, for us, there are two areas that are, well, more than two, but two that we see enormous potential for growth. Uh, certainly, the, as I mentioned earlier, the IT area. If you look uh, really from here all the way down through Miami, the demand for IT uh, workers is enormous. Uh, one of the benefits we have here, because I, uh, my job before I came here was really with economic development with the University of Clemson in South Carolina, and we would have companies that were wanting to relocate to South Carolina, but they would say, we're coming and we need uh, 400 graduates uh, from computer science each year. I couldn't find 400 computer science graduates between Clemson, University of South Carolina, Georgia Tech, and UN, within a 100 mile race in UNC Charlotte or, or UNC Asheville. There just weren't that many that were coming that would stay in the region. And the reason they wanted to come to South Carolina and the reason they would want to come to Florida is because the competition for that hired person is less. So if you're in, in Palo Alto, or you're in Columbus, Ohio, or if you're in Boston, all a person has to do is walk across the street and get a different job. They don't have to take their kids out of school. They go get a $30,000 salary increase doing something similar for another company in a different building. Uh, they get off the subway maybe one stop later. Two months later, they change jobs again. And so they would have this workforce that kept rotating, and they would love to, those companies would love to come to a place like this where people aren't just hopping around and easily going from job to job. But we have to have the quantity of graduates, people who want to stay in this area. And most of our graduates, uh, if they're local, they would like to stay in Florida. Uh, so I think that, that is certainly one big area. Uh, another big area for us uh, is, is definitely going to be the life sciences. Um, life sciences have so much potential in this region, and everybody knows the stories of Scripps and Max Planck being on, on the Jupiter campus that we have. We're getting ready to be named, uh, I guess I shouldn't tell you, we'll wait till uh, December 1. Big announcement uh, coming on December 1 uh, that Beth knows about. Uh, it was planned before the hurricane, but it'll be, have to be December 1. Uh, but there's a lot of vibrancy around the life sciences, and it's a, it's a complex industry. So. If Scripps creates something of, of high interest as a drug, uh, it may take 10 years for that to get from their labs to the marketplace. So how do you expedite that movement of something to the marketplace? Uh, and also, if you create something of high value, how do you keep somebody from just coming and buying that away and taking it to La Jolla or taking it to Boston? And, and so those become the, the reasons that we need a, a, an economy that takes something and moves it all the way to completion. So, if you were to ask Fred Sencilio, uh, who's a, a process chemist, what's his biggest missing thing? He needs chemists who are on the regulated side, not just a chemistry major, but somebody who can work on the formulations on the regulated side. So we ended up, for him, creating a, a new uh, add-on degree. So we took our great chemistry graduates, uh, and Fred had 28 jobs open, and now we have all those students in a pipeline to have the regulated side, what you call the pharmacy side of chemistry, taught to them, and then they'll go as immediate employees into his company. But if he can't get those people, he has to leave. He can't run a company without regulated chemists. So I, I think that that's one of the things is kind of listening constantly to the marketplace. And if you aren't meeting that demand, is there a way you can create something that allows the value to be added to keep that company and make it successful? <laughs> That's great. Do we have time for one question? Yeah. So the last thing I wanted to ask each of you is what do you like most about your job and what's the most important lesson you've learned since you've been the president? Well, uh, 
I think what I like most is, uh, is an easy answer, students. Uh, to work on a college campus and to do what we have to do administratively, uh, I enjoy that, that's fun. But the, uh, the most fun is when I walk out of my office, I leave all that behind, I go out on the campus and I sit down and talk to students and listen to them about their dreams, listen to them about uh, what they want to become, listen to them about how they cannot learn math. Anybody in the room have a solution to mathematics? That is a stopper for so many students. We have to find a way to, to resolve that issue. But, uh, and then uh, I like to talk to them when they've taken one of the courses that we've actually contextualized. In other words, in an English course, English is English, okay, but the topics you write on can be about industry. It can be about the workplace. It can be about other topics that they get involved in, and then they all of a sudden begin to really like and enjoy English. So to talk to the students is, is the most fun. And uh, my eight seconds has passed. What was the second part of that? What's the most important <laughs> lesson you've learned since Don't we've you done? just have to stay on a bull for eight seconds? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I learned that uh, uh, in, in, in running a college or running anything else, I think the major thing, and sometimes we overlook it, is you have to take time to spend time with the people and to form the culture within your organization or within your company that is going to produce the highest performance and the highest outcome. So what kind of workplace do people really like to work in? Where are they going to do their best work? Where are they going to perform at the highest possible level? And uh, how do you empower them to actually have the freedom to make choices, to take chances, to do things different, and then applaud them for doing that? And I, uh, I, I learned that, uh, especially as, as generations have changed, that has become even more important to give them uh, to give them a little bit more freedom, a little bit more space so that they can be creative and entrepreneurial in their own right. Great. I think that um, what I like most about the job is, um, is a strategy associated with um, developing a place that works for students, that works for employees, and that works for the community. And the idea of putting together something that responds to all of those needs um, it, to me, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's the kind of thing that keeps you up at night. You know, how is it that we can make this work? Because I feel like we have so many constituents. So I think that that's probably the most exciting thing about the job is you know, that the constituents are all very different, but there's an expectation that their public um, college is going to meet all of those needs. So the way that you know, how we pull that together so that it makes sense for those different folks is, uh, is pretty cool to me. Um, probably a thing I've learned is probably um, something that's related to what Ed was saying is that um, you know if, if I can't um, if I can't keep um, my work community happy and is if I can't keep the people that work at the college happy it's really hard for me to, to deliver to students and so you know and it's difficult because again you have folks who have different needs so I, I've learned that um, that we really have to develop a culture, as Ed has described, to ensure, as Ed has described, excuse me, to ensure that um, folks are excited about helping our students. And so to me, that's um, kind of got spanked a couple of times on not getting all that right. So, yes. Okay. Um, for me, we, we had this term, it's a term I brought, but um, it's, I like seeing it ad adopted. Uh, it's simple, it's unbridled ambition. I love seeing it in students, I love seeing it in faculty. Uh, and what it really means is um, when you wake up in the morning, you got a fire in your belly and you got things you wanna do and you're excited and you're motivated. There's no, nothing more fun than being around people who really have high intent and they can work together to accomplish goals. Uh, we actually trademarked that term, uh, unbridled ambition, and uh, only one person has violated the trademark. Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> we had to send his campaign and notice, you see this little R? That means trademark. <laughs> don't, don't use our term, you'll run it. Um, but, um, and what was the second question? Uh, What's the most important lesson you've learned since becoming oh, president? Uh, the most important lesson, uh, when, when someone tells you it can't be done, don't believe it. Um, it it's so serious. Uh, 
people would say, well, you'll never get that kind of person to come to FAU. Well, yes, we will. And I have personally interviewed, I don't know how many people. Uh, and they said, well, the president shouldn't do that. I'm going to prove we can do it. So we got the number two guy at Harvard Med School as the new dean of the College of Medicine. Harvard's coming to FAU. <laughs> we got the, the number two person at the University of Florida. They're getting ready to do a $3 billion capital campaign. She's the new vice president for development at FAU. We got the number one guy out of Vanderbilt uh, who is at our Jupiter campus. He's a neuroscientist. He's the one this big announcement's going to be about uh, on December 1. We got the number one guy out of NYU who is a uh, Alzheimer, uh, dementia, Parkinson's disease expert. He's getting ready to do the first clinical trial in the United States on Lewy body dementia, which is what Robin Williams and many other people have died from. And so when someone says you can't, you can. You just can't listen to the can't part. Because if you believe you can't, you won't. Anyway. That's great. So we have a lot of horsepower on this stage right now. And these people are very important to South Florida. Let's give them a big round of applause. For them. Thank you. That's great. That's what I thought. There's somebody. Sorry. <laughs> I thought we were done. I just, I just have a, a, a quick one. Uh, I think it was about five years ago that uh, the uh, state realized that the 10 or 11 universities were not able to handle the number of people in the state that wanted baccalaureate degrees, so they went to the 28. Uh, community colleges and allowed uh, 24 of them, I believe, to grant baccalaureate degrees. And uh, I, that sounded great at the time. Uh, I, I'd, li I'd like to hear, especially Ed, who's lived through it, what the experiences have been. And even John can uh, take a slightly different view of it. Uh, I heard you say you had 72 different tracks to earn um, uh, associate degrees, did I hear that correct? Um, and it, that seemed important given that a lot of people are saying that we're not preparing our students for jobs that don't require baccalaureate degrees. We seem to be reaching higher, and it's great to know you're even reaching higher than that, but I'd like to hear from the three of you what your experience has been uh, given those, those circumstances. Okay. Uh this is uh, years in the making. I'll try to really boil it down here. But uh, prior to John coming, and I think we would take the same approach with FAU that we took back then, uh, Frank Brogren was uh, president at that time, uh, had a personal conversation with Frank, and then we decided to bring our board of trustees together. Uh, we came together as two different boards from university and at that time a community college, and we talked about baccalaureates along the Treasure Coast. Uh, we at that time laid out a plan, uh, basically a 10-year plan to offer baccalaureate programs. Now remember, these baccalaureate programs are limited to workforce areas. And uh, what we've seen within the institution and within the community, because the populations are, are quite different from the younger population that goes away to the university as a resident to move to the university, most of our students are place-bound students. That means they are uh, older to start with, older is relative term. They're older than the typical uh, student that goes away to college. They have place-bound responsibilities in terms of jobs, in terms of homes, in terms of children, and uh, they, they just can't pull up and, and take off and, and go finish their degree in a, in a reasonable length of time with all of those other responsibilities. So having them located and, and offered at a local level has been a great benefit to our community. Uh, we have uh, 17 different programs. The programs are in workforce-based areas. And uh, a lot of our students are AS transfer students. Now that's, I know we're getting into the weeds here. An AA student is a student that has taken the appropriate courses transferred to university. An AS student is taking courses to go to work. That means that they have a different set of general education courses. 
So John mentioned a flipped classroom. The baccalaureate degree in this case is, is flipped to some degree, where they still have to, in their baccalaureate degree, earn the appropriate number of general education courses in order to get a baccalaureate degree. And many times they're locked into a job where they can't get a promotion because they only have a two-year degree. And so we have a, uh, we have roughly a 88, 89% placement rate. We have a very high completion rate on the baccalaureates. They are getting jobs or they're in jobs and being promoted on the job based on getting the baccalaureate degree. Uh, one other really quick thing, I think it's been good for our faculty. Our faculty were teaching with doctorates at the two-year level. So when they know that they could possibly get their own product as a junior in our college and they would have to teach them again perhaps as a junior level offering, I think it's actually helped them uh, better understand the larger number that we actually transfer to the university to be sure that they're really better prepared. And then of course they want them better prepared if they're gonna be in their own classes. And it's kind of an internal kind of thing that I've seen take place. So um, we offer uh, three bachelor's um, degrees. So it's um, in nursing, information technology, and management. Um, and I think that um, I agree with most of, of what Ed has said about it. Mainly it's, um, it's students who really would like to get promotions on their jobs in a lot of instances. Um, and they are place bound. And so they're looking for a way to go into management. Um, so often what you'll find is that in the evenings, uh, right next to our bachelor's building, you'll see folks who are like stuffing their faces because they've worked all day and now they're gonna come to the programs in the evening in order to earn their bachelor's degrees. Um, the one thing I think that uh, mo fo most folks may not realize is that what we do and what, uh, what Ed does is that really even within our own, um, own programs there are two plus two. That is that students don't come to us as freshmen, get admitted, and then assume they're going to be with us for the, um, for the four years. They have to complete their AA or at least their AS and then apply for admission into our bachelor's programs pretty much the same way they would apply, to apply um, as if they were going to transfer over to FAU. So I think that, um, that to me, it's been a really good thing for those students who really want to advance in their careers and really just don't have a lot of options um, and see us as an affordable as well as meaningful way to make a difference within the job um, that, they are, that, that, that they want to continue and or if they could go away, they would, but it just doesn't make sense. Um, so I think it's been, um, a, a very beneficial thing. I think it's filled some gaps and been very positive for the community. Very much, or at least my um, orientation has been toward uh, don't get bigger, get better. And so we've frozen essentially the size of the university. We're niching it uh, separately. The Honors College, as most of you probably know, is on the Jupiter campus. <clears throat> That's such a unique setting to have scripts there in Max Planck. We have about 430 students in the Honors College. I think it could go to 1,000 and then eventually to 3,000. But we, would, we don't want to build the dorms. So th this becomes limiting for us. If we spend all our resources building dorms, uh, we won't be able to do what we need to do in the classroom. But you could attract the brightest kids in the world, not in Florida, not in the country, in the world to that campus because of the unique location. And you could have the kids living all around the campus uh, in the private mm. sector could build those dorms. With, we could do the public-private partnerships. Mm. Boca is about 25,000 uh, students, about 5,000 graduate students, 20,000 undergrads. Uh, we've consistently increased the admission standards each year. So the intent is not to grow Boca except by transfers. So if you come in the front door at Boca, the admission standards are getting higher and higher to get in the front door. The, the easier way to get there if the grades are not there is to, to transfer in, and that's certainly a great option. I, I feel that we have a, a lot more work we could do together uh, in terms of figuring out the transfer. Uh, I'd say uh, University of Central Florida has put this uh, UCF Direct program mm -hmm. in place, and it really orients mm -hmm. the person from the moment they show up at State College in, in the pathway, and I think we could do a, I'll, I'll do a better job. I'll say I should do a better job in working with you all on, on doing that. And then our Davie campus has about 5,000 students. All those students are transfer students, a lot of them from Miami-Dade and, and from, um, from Broward College. So total population's 30, and I hope the total population stays at 30. Uh, it may go up a little bit in transfers. Very good. 
Great.